let me wish you a warm welcome to this breakfast meeting. As you know, the Yalyamashon Foundation tries to organize interesting breakfast meetings when we get visitors that are worthwhile to listen to. And since this week we have a visitor here who certainly is more than worthwhile listening to, we decided to call for a meeting to inform a little bit about the situation in the Ukraine. The Ukraine is for us, Swedes, a very important country. <laughs> not least because it, may, it is a part of the Eastern Partnership, <clears throat> this cooperation between the European Union and the East European countries, which is a brainchild of Sweden and Poland in the European Union. But also, and not least our sports fans around are certainly aware of it, because the Ukraine is going to play an important role during the summer when the European football games are going to be held. And don't forget, the, first, the very first game of them all is going to be the game, the match between Sweden and the Ukraine in Kiev. And it's going to be very interesting because nobody will know who is the supporters because we have the same national colors. And <clears throat> as you know, uh, as you will know, uh, the Ukraine has, in the beginning, when the Eastern Partnership was founded, played a very good role. But during the last couple of months, the record when it comes to democratization, human rights, rule of law, hasn't been as good as we would all have liked it to be. I myself have been, and my, some of you might have read that, three weeks ago I've been to the Ukraine trying to visit Yulia Timoshenko in prison. And I wasn't allowed to do that. I wasn't surprised about that. But it only showed that our concerns really have to be very well founded. Next year, the Ukraine is also going to take over the chairmanship in the OSCE. And when I was in the Ukraine, I was asked by a couple of representatives there, but are you going to take it away from us, the chairmanship, if we don't perform it? I said, no. We are not going to do that at all. But any country having the, having the chairmanship in the OSCE has to be a role model for the 55 other participating states. And what we hope and pray for is that the Ukraine is sharpening their wits. The government is trying to understand what, it, what it's asked for so that they can be the role model that they themselves intend to be. With these couple of thoughts, I would like to introduce our morning speaker, this early morning speaker. Our early morning speaker is the most important man today in the opposition in the Ukraine, <coughs> Arseniy Yatsenyuk, who, despite his very young age, has already been Minister of Economy, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Speaker of the Ukrainian Parliament, he ran for presidency of the country. He has been the chairman of the Ukrainian National Bank. He has founded a movement which is now an opposition party which is called Front of Change. And he is going to tell us a little bit about the situation that we can see nowadays in the Ukraine and about the development that he hopes for or expects or fears for during this year. You have the floor, Asim. Thank you so much. Pleasure to see you, everyone. Good morning. I'm not mistaken. This I, I try to undertake the first step in order to speak Swedish. Uh, the key problem is that I never been in Sweden before. I took an enormous position, but it probably stumbled the European integration due to the fact that this is the perfect country and the great city I discovered yesterday. Uh, it's really an honor to address you, and uh, I have a pleasure to deliver you some thoughts related to Ukraine. You are well aware that there is a huge tension, a huge political tension in Ukraine. And first of all, it's related to political persecution of the former prime minister, and she used to be a political rival to incumbent President Yanukovych. So she's in prison. She's charge of uh, abuse of power, and the general prosecutor's office uh, launched another three investigations related to tax fraud, um, related to another part of abuse of power, and there are some rumors that they're going to charge her with the conspiracy and murder. 
Um, the thing is that that's wrong. That's wrong to persecute political rivals. That's what Yanukovych did for the last two years. And we as an opposition have the key goal, one of the aims of the opposition is to release Timoshenko and to restore law and order in my country. Uh, political agenda and economic agenda for my country is really complicated. We are to face parliamentary elections in seven months. So the elections to be held on 28th of October 2012. And this is going to be a milestone and a certain checkpoint whether Ukraine can preserve democracy or not. As I already indicated that one of the goals of, position, of the opposition is to restore justice in the country and to relieve Yulia. But the key goal for the opposition and for political party I am leading is to change the country. To change the country in terms of hard and tough reforms in judicial systems, in economy, to change the constitution, and, ch and to change the way we are moving. For today, Ukraine moves back, but not forward. Uh, I would probably start with the international agenda. You are well aware that Ukraine uh, initialed DCFTA and political association agreement a few days ago. But to initial is not to sign. And to sign is not to ratify. And the key impediment on this way is the ratification procedure. And that's clear for all of us that uh, the DCFTA could be ratified and signed only in <coughs> Ukraine first. That's free and fair elections. And it, it can end if Ukrainian government stops political persecution in my country. So these are the two pillars or two triggers that would actually instigate uh, the national parliaments and the European Commission to sign and to ratify uh, this agreement. What's on stake? It's not just about the CFTA. It's not just an agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. It's more. It's it's an answer on the key question for Ukraine and Ukrainians. What type of country we are? What shares? What values we share? What standards we are stick to? If we move to the European Union, if we move to the Euro European standards, if we share EU values, we need to be a part of this so-called big Europe. It's clear that the membership is an ultimate goal, but a long-range ultimate goal. A strategic one. Uh, as a key step, an important one to be undertaken by Ukraine and the European Union, we need this agreement. This is not the agreement for the government or for the incumbent president. As I strongly believe that President Yanukovych is one time president. This is the agreement for the country with a population of 45 million people. This is the agreement for a very big European country that do really share European values. And that's the reason we, are, we usually ask our European partners not to stumble, uh, to back EU-Ukraine aspirations, to back Ukrainian people, in order to change the country and in order to get the assistance from our European partners using different leverages incorporated in DCFTA and in political association agreement. On the other hand, we have our Russian friends. I would say Russian neighbors, but... Uh, you are well aware about very democratic process in Russia in terms of new old elected president. And uh, we feel, I would say, a warm heart from our Russian neighbors, an extremely warm heart. As Russia will definitely try to establish something like a new Soviet Union, or a new Eurasia, or an upgraded version of the former Soviet Republic. And the new old president of Russia was very clear, stating in uh, his Vestia article a few months ago, that this is, I, I usually say, he has a dream too. That he has a dream to have a big country, and Ukraine is to be an integral part of this customs union, or new Soviet Union, or new Russian Empire, or whatever. So that's the choice for Ukrainian people, where to move for. And we as an opposition, we strongly believe that Ukraine will move <coughs> towards the European Union, but not towards the customs union, or, or any type of union with our Russian neighbors. Nevertheless, we need to have uh, good relations with this big neighbor and uh, actually 
DCFTA, not DCFTA, but just free, free trade area with Russia and former Soviet countries is needed for Ukraine. But it's to be a win-win situation with Russia, but not just win-lose situation as it is for today. Uh, domestic agenda. Domestic agenda, I would stress and underline uh, the key importance of uh, the free and fair elections in Ukraine, the forthcoming election. This is going to be the test for the final test. It could be legal test for the government of Ukraine, but I believe that uh, we're going to pass these elections and we're going to do, as an opposition, we, do, we, we will do our utmost in order to have free and fair elections in order to defend every vote, in order to defend every ballot, and in order to, sh to show that the opposition is ready to win and the opposition is ready to change things in my country. Uh, we ask our European partners and our Western partners to send observers and uh, to participate and uh, to back the idea of having these really democratic elections in my country. Uh, the, the story and the history of Ukrainian elections are quite acceptable. Look at the elections of 2010, 2006, and 2007. I mean, parliamentary and presidential one. They were free and fair, and uh, we need to do our utmost in order to back up the same story in the future. Uh, what goals opposition has, except the goal to release Yumashenko and stop political persecution? I will start probably with the Ukrainian constitution because Yanukovych, the incumbent president, he did a tremendous and dramatic thing for my country. Just misusing the constitutional court, he just changed the constitution. With no parliamentary assembly, with no voting procedure, without any people, the constitutional court ruled out and that the current constitution is unconstitutional and the constitutional court last year decided to overrule the current constitution and to go back to the former constitution of the former president Kuchma. No one voted in favor of this decision in the parliament, neither Ukrainian population didn't support this idea on the referendum or any kind of uh, <coughs> policy. So we definitely need to change the constitution and to restore the balance of powers in my country. Because for today Yanukovych He's like the Tsar, and even more. He actually controls everything in, in the country, starting with the judicial branch of power and then with the parliament. Because parliament became a subsidiary of the presidential administration. So the key factor for the, for the people of Ukraine is to change the constitution, to restore the balance of power, to have independent judiciary, to have independent prosecutor, general prosecutor's office, and to have the president, but not the emperor. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes time and enormous efforts in order to do this. The president launched, launched the so-called Constitutional Assembly, but the opposition refused to participate in the Presidential Constitutional Assembly due to one reason. The president is to guarantee the Constitution, but not to change the Constitution. And we asked and proposed to have a certain type of Constitutional Assembly in the, in the Parliament, but not in the Presidential Administration. And uh, we asked the president to disclose the aim to change the constitution. What is he going to change? Is he going to get another iron fist on judicially, or is he going really to distribute the powers and uh, to change and to introduce the rule of law state in my country? Uh, another aspect related to economic agenda. We definitely feel uh, complicated, I would say, complicated financial plight. It's related to different stuff, starting with the gas prices. It's, it's not a news that Ukraine pays the highest price in the EU to our Russian partners, Gazprom. The average price is about 500 bucks per one, billion, one million cubic meters. It's about 40% higher rather than the average price in the European Union. Uh, we try to renegotiate with Russia, but to no avail. So that's the first factor. Another one is that uh, the IMF loan is on hold due to very, I would say, ineffective reforms in the government as the IMF urges to increase tariffs, as the IMF urges to implement reform and the government is not ready to do it in the forthcoming elections. 
uh, as they believe that it would definitely jeopardize the approval ratings and the numbers of the president and the government. So they are not ready to increase tariffs. They are not ready to change the social standards. They are not ready to do anything in order to get the IMF loan. For the year 2012, the overall debt to be repaid is about 10 billion bucks. It's quite a big amount of cash. Quite a big. And the government is really out of this cash. I don't want to say that Ukraine is to face social rights, no. But everything could happen. And in case if the government will still be on hold in implementing economic reforms, uh, we could face not just a political, but uh, social and economic turbulence. And that's the other reason why we need the support of our European investment bank. Uh, their position is to be united, I believe, on the next parliamentary election and we are to propose a clear cut action plan how to change the country, what we are for and what we are against. Uh, that's, that's in brief. I would propose you to enter a Q&A session, <coughs> not just to lecture. I'm sure that you're not interested in getting any kind of lectures. I am absolutely open to answer any question you, you want. Thank you very much. It was, I think, a very good introduction, and I'm very glad that you are ready to enter a Q&A session instantly. May I just, since <laughs> I'm leading this, have uh, the opportunity to ask you the very first question. The people you meet here in this room are all politically active in different organizations, parties, or journalists. The question that I would like to ask you as the first one is, what can we do here in Sweden to help? We, a sort of grassroots people here in Sweden, what can we do to help you and your ideas and, I don't know, to form the platform to see that the election goes well? That's of great importance for us. And I would especially underline uh, Mr. Karl Bid, who is doing a lot in order to support Ukraine and in order to support Ukrainian democracy. Yesterday we met, we had a meeting, and uh, an informal one, and uh, this kind of, and this type of informal meetings are extremely effective. What we ask you for, first and the key issue, the election process. We ask our Western partners to monitor the election process, and to start this type of monitoring, monitoring right now, because the elections is not the way you cast the ballot. The elections, how media works, how administrative resources acts, how the president acts, uh, whether they try to change the legislation, whether they try to press on the opposition. So that's, that's the key factor which urgently needed for, for, for the state of Ukraine. Uh, the second issue related to the observers. So we need observers. I do remember 2004, and you probably remember times of Orange Revolution, when our Western partners sent more than 14,000 observers. Uh, the overall number of polling stations in Ukraine is 34,000, and 30% they, of them are located in rural areas. And this is the best way to reach the election <coughs> in rural areas, where people are very poor, and the government can easily buy the vote of Ukrainians. So we need an observers. We ask you for a certain type of uh, scrutiny over the Ukrainian government. They, they need... The, I believe that they will feel your warm breeze in their neck. And that's, that's really good in terms of having these free and fair elections. Uh, the third issue, and uh, I would underline again, it's important for the people of Ukraine not to stop the dialogue with Ukraine. I mean Ukraine, but not Ukrainian government. Because presidents usually change. Prime ministers change too but people still remain, and the country still remains. So we ask you to support Ukrainians in our EU aspirations. Thank you. Marieta. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, and that's about the election and the constitution. The constitution is changed, and that means a problem, because if it should be a free and fair election, which I really hope it would be, it's must also be together with the Constitution. And if the Constitution is not, I mean, if it's replaced and it doesn't allow the election to be free and fair, how, do you have any remarks on that? If I may, I will try to split 
in these two particular issues. The constitutional process, it's, it's a really complicated stuff. My feeling is that Yanukovych triggered the process of the constitutional amendments due to one reason. He is scared that he will lose the next direct presidential election. He wants to change the election system and to be elected president in the parliament, but not by a direct election. That's the only reason. And that's the reason why I asked Yanukovych to unfold his plans. If he's scared of the people of Ukraine, he's to resign right now, but not to change the constitution in, in order to refrain, to retain his position. Uh, the election process is more based on the new election law. It was a very, I would say, dialogue, tough dialogue between the opposition and the government in terms of making new election law. What we did, we did, we did everything in order to defend the voters. We did everything in order to incorporate the legal norms that will not allow the president and the government to reach the election. But despite this, what they got, they got a new old election system. Uh, the last parliamentary elections were based on proportional system, so party list system. The forthcoming elections will be based on the mixed system. 50% is proportional one, and 50% is single mandate counties. This would probably allow the president <coughs> to grab the majority in the new parliament, just buying, taking, frightening, as Kuchma did in 2002, some members of the parliament. That's the reason why opposition is to be united in terms of having a, the most influential and the biggest fractions in the new parliament. If people trust that you can win, they will never betray you. Thank you. Putin? <coughs> yes. Uh, how long can Ukraine juggle these two grand designs? The, uh, well, the Putin one or the European one? and uh, uh, the re relative importance for Ukraine of d domestic politics in a more narrow sense and, and this, these grand designs. I mean, don't you have to make up your mind first before, or, or, or can you, I mean, pursue running after two hairs, as Mr. Fyodor Lukyanov says, this uh, in Russian global affairs, that. Ukraine is constantly running after two hires and you never know where you will end up and then maybe you will have to decide upon that. Um, of course, at the same time as working for internal democracy. Please. If you try to sit on two chairs, you usually sit in the midst. Mm -hmm. It always happens. And I want to be very clear on this particular issue. You can't be in between the EU and Russia. You can be a very close friend to both Russia and the EU. You have to be closer to someone. And that's our decision. I strongly believe that Ukraine shares European values. So we are and we will be an integral part of a big Europe. You are absolutely right in indicating, I would say, domestic problem. But look at the numbers. The majority of Ukrainians back EU integration. And mainly due to Yanukovych activity. Because the numbers are growing. I do remember the numbers two years ago. And it was in favor of customs union with Russia. And for today, it just switched. Um, but it's not just the declaration to be, to share the European values. It's a clear-cut agenda. It's to tackle corruption. And, and we are to start with the president and his close allies. This is the key problem in my country. To restore democracy, to have an indep independent judiciary, to have freedom of speech, and to have all freedoms that are actually entitled in the European Union. So, uh, summarizing, Ukraine is to be a part of the big Europe. Ukraine is to sign and ratify DCFTA and political association agreement. We are to have good economic relations with our Russian partners. 
but we are to be a part of the Western world and Western values. Uh, I guess uh, some of the questions. One of them you mentioned uh, uh, Russia, and that Russia would that means, uh, re elected President Putin would start to start to, to start the pressure on, on Ukraine. Do, uh, do you know from where Russia would start? Russia from custom Union or so? My second question, uh, you underlined several key challenges for Ukraine, economic, possible financial turmoil, elections, but uh, from our perspective, uh, and this is I'm ambassador for Lithuania, we see also the big problem of corruption, which is a rule of law, which is definitely a big problem of your country to portray Ukraine as a, as a key European value country. Uh, my third small question is also, sorry, but uh, no, just, uh, my uh, third question is, uh, if you mean among the other Central European countries, in the EU circle, we are struggling uh, for European perspective of Ukraine. Is, is this is also you see as a key, key issue of EU uh, uh, defining Ukraine that the country which EU perspective? Because this is still a uh, uh, struggle within the EU. My final small question, and uh, I'm finishing. NATO. I know that uh, this is also not currently at the high uh, the Ukraine's agenda. Ukraine is, is a loyal partner and active partner, but uh, membership is currently out of the agenda. Do you envisage uh, with, uh, say, uh, opposition winning elections, the, the NATO membership would start to get the uh, issue? First, I, 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 we are very grateful to your country for the support in Ukraine. And we appreciate it. And you're doing a really great job for the people of Ukraine. Uh, NATO and Putin somehow correlated sometimes. I do remember Bucharest summit, and you probably remember. Yes, I do. What has happened, what had happened in, in, in Europe and among NATO member countries? We were so close in signing map, that Russian friends became just furious about this. And they won the game. It was not just Ukrainian fault. Look, let's be frank. It much depends on NATO too. Whether Ukraine is an important partner for NATO. Or Russia is more important. Sometimes I am astonished with the General Secretary NATO statements he made for the last two years. Sometimes I believe that Russia is a NATO member, due to his words. Uh, the same gonna happen in, in, in case if we come close to the ratification procedure of the DCFTA and Political Association Agreement. Just trust me. If the procedure will be online, back on track, our Russian friends will again become furious about this. We're going to have the same case scenario as we had on NATO issue. Uh, even more, Yanukovych promised to make Ukraine a non bloc country. God knows what does it mean. He still believes that there are blocks in, in, in the world. Or bricks, blocks, something like that. <coughs> I mean, not the, not the new bricks, yeah. just blocks. And it's true that Yanukovych changed the legislation on national security and defense and eliminated NATO, NATO <coughs> as an ultimate goal for Ukraine. And for today, Ukraine is a gray zone in terms of military and security. And he is to realize this, that we are in between NATO member countries and this so-called <coughs> ODKB, or Tashkent Treaty. And you are well aware that Mr. Putin, another dream of Mr. Putin is to make uh, a new military strong bloc on the basis of ODKB, on the basis of Tashkent Treaty. So we are in between. And as I said, we are to be a members of the Western world. And the Western world means the EU, and the Western world means NATO. There is no other security model on the globe. Sorry to tell you that, but I, I don't trust it the European Union can have an independent security model. Um, Putin, he starts always with Ukraine. 
consumption of the natural gas is about 52 billion cubic meters. It's 3.5 times higher rather than Poland consumes. But compare Polish GDP and Ukrainian one. Polish one is three times higher rather than the Ukrainian one. So a total and absolute energy inefficiency in the country. And it costs a lot for my country. But despite this, I still believe that the contract we have with Russia is not fair. We do not ask for any kind of discount to our Russian friends. We need a fair price. But just going back to the issue of discounts, Russia granted uh, numerous discounts to numerous EU member countries in the, in the last two years. Depending on, on the country, and depending on the volume of consumption, but from, from 10 to 30 percent. <coughs> and we still, we as Ukraine, still pay the highest price. You're well aware that Ukraine is a member of Energy Community Treaty. And as we are the members of the Energy Community Treaty, we can't have any type of consortium with Russia. I mean bilateral consortium. Otherwise, we are to denounce the Energy Community Treaty. That's the reason we are, why we ask our European partners to step in into the negotiations between Ukraine and Russia on, on gas deal and energy issues. We are obliged to support each other, as we are the members of the one union. Russia is not a member of the energy treaty. Neither energy charter nor energy treaty, energy community treaty. Uh, as far as we know, Russia proposed a bilateral consortium with Ukraine in order to get a major share, a controlled share in Ukrainian gas transportation system. What we ask for our European partners, we ask them to step in and if we launch something like a trilateral consortium, it could work. Uh, going back to the issue of the modernization of Ukrainian gas transportation system, you probably do remember that two and a half years ago, the EU Commission and Ukraine signed the declaration on the modernization. modernization. If we invest into Ukrainian gas transportation system, we're going to save up to 6 billion cubic meters of natural gas. This is the natural gas that gas tra transportation system consumes for the trans transporting of Russian gas. So we are to substitute gas pumps with the electricity one. And the EBRD had uh, this type of project two years ago. So we definitely need to do it. This is, this is a business-oriented project. That's not just a political one. So we ask European partners to step in the negotiations. We ask to we ask our European partners to participate in modern, modernization. We ask them to invest. Sevastopol. Sevastopol. Again, gas and Sevastopol are correlated to. Last year, President Yanukovych signed a new deal with Russian uh, government on the deployment of uh, Black Sea Fleet in Ukraine. Uh, just to explain it, Russia granted a very vague $100 discount for Russian gas, and Ukraine <coughs> extended a mandate for a Russian Black Sea fleet deployed in Sevastopol for another 25 years. What Russia is trying to do? Russia is trying to control the Black Sea. That's it. And uh, they asked the government of Ukraine to allow new types of weapon to be deployed in Sevastopol. They asked the government of Ukraine to build a modern, actually, and powerful Russian military base in Sevastopol. Uh, my feeling is that <coughs> Russian base 
will be in Sevastopol for a certain period of time. God knows, probably, Ukraine in the forthcoming future could do something in order to limit the presence of Russian Navy on the Ukrainian territory. Because this is another impediment in terms of NATO and in terms of global security. Uh, but I am sure that Sevastopol is not a hot spot in today's Ukraine. Neither Sevastopol nor Crimea. They can try to misuse, you know, in order to instigate some kind of uh, uncertainty and turbulence, but that's not the hot spot. Uh, <coughs> my name is Helen Gertz, I'm from the Swedish Foundation for Human Rights. Um, I would like to ask you a little bit about the goals of the opposition when it comes to human rights. You've already mentioned uh, the need of change in the judicial system. You've talked about anti-corruption measures and the freedom of speech. But I would like to ask you, what do you consider to be the absolute most important changes for the Ukrainian people when it comes to human rights? And do you have anything specific that you consider would be most important for Ukrainian women as well? <coughs> for Ukrainian, I would start with the Ukrainian women. We had a round table last month, if I'm not mistaken, on the gender policy in Ukraine. And I believe that sometime in Ukraine, the structure of Ukrainian parliament would be similar to the Swiss one. But the actual population of Ukrainian, if you, if you compare the male and female uh, numbers in, in Ukraine, so we, have, we need to have a parliament where the majority belongs to Ukrainian women. For today, only 8% of Ukrainian members of parliament are women. And, and that's, that's the key priority for us, to have gender equality in our country. On the issue of human rights, we need to do our utmost in order to execute the declaration, the general declaration of human, women's human rights. That's, that's my answer. I, I want our people to be proud of my country. I want them to live freely in my country, to speak freely, to have an opportunities, and to have chances to execute these opportunities. Thank you. Um, let's say human rights and gas and talk to football. Uh, I have a question. Since when South Africa arranged the World Cup, um, they, uh, a lot of investments were made in the country and they got a good chance to display the country as well. I think it got a good boost when it came to freedom, democracy, and market economy. I think South Africa um, really got some good things out of it. And I think that Ukraine now have a perfect opportunity as well to develop. And I, I wonder, has it, have you seen any um, changes or effects from the European Championship yet? And what do you think will happen? Result in the Ukraine. Oh, who's gonna win? Ukraine or Sweden? <laughs> well, let, let's try to have a win-win situation. I'm not sure we can we can do it in football, but nevertheless, uh, championship. I would start probably with the investment. The government invested about ten billion dollars into the infrastructure in order to build up stadiums, airports, in order to build up the infrastructure for the year 2012. I would rephrase. The taxpayers invested $10 billion in two or three stadiums, two airports, and one road. Two Ukrainian stadium in Kyiv is one of the most expensive in the world. It costs just one billion dollars. It's really great to have your championship and we fully support it. Because this is, this is another type of test for Ukraine. Whether Ukraine is a European country, how we can hold this uh, championship. Uh, <coughs> It's, it's a chance for you to visit Ukraine and to feel that Ukraine is a part of real Europe. And no doubt it's going to happen. And we, as a people of Ukraine, will do our utmost in order to provide you good reflections about Ukraine after a championship. 
But another part of the story is the thing that you mentioned, investment, which is not an investment, it's a corruption. It can cost $10 million, full stop. It just can cost. If you pay $10 billion, we can do it in South Africa, in, 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 in Germany, and other mundial, and in Poland, and in uh, Ukraine. It's quite a substantial amount of money to spend just on one championship. Uh, but going back to the, to the European Championship, I, I still believe that this is going to be an event. A really positive event for everyone, for both of us, and uh, I ask you to visit Ukraine. To become a fan, not only of Swedish football team, but to become a fan of Ukraine too. Yes, uh, as you said, the new old Ukrainian constitution gives the president very wide powers. Uh, what does that mean, even if you were to win elections in, in September? What can and what can't you do, given the, the constitution and the, the division of powers? Very important question, sir. So that's the reason why we need the majority in the new parliament. Just to remind you that under the Ukrainian constitution, the parliament, and, and this is, I would say, the last resort of the parliament, the parliament uh, gives an approval for the prime minister. The key task for the opposition is to win and to get the heart of the speaker and to get the speaker of the house. This is the first step. And if we get the majority and the speaker of the house, we can fight. We can fight with the president. We can fight in order to change the constitution and to change his attitude to the Constitution and to the people of Ukraine. That's the reason why we need the majority. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question about uh, the judicial reform of the judicial system. Uh, the conviction rate in Ukrainian courts uh, is around 98, 99% and has been under all Ukrainian governments. Why has it been so difficult to do something about this? Uh, I'm going to give you the numbers. The conviction rate is zero point. Uh, sorry, the absolute. The conviction rate is ninety nine point eight percent. Stalin did that. In Stalin's time and in Soviet times, the conviction rate was about ninety percent. So in the in the current Ukraine, it's ninety nine point eight percent. And the reason why. It's very clear. The outdated panel code. Look at the article Timoshenko charged off. The article, the correct translation of this article is abuse of power. This article was designed in 1926. So the author is Mr. Stalin and Mr. Beria, probably. So the, 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 the key factor is to change the Ukrainian penalty code and to change the code of criminal procedures. We need to introduce a due process in Ukraine. That's, we, that's what we don't have. The government introduced a blueprint of the new criminal code of the criminal <coughs> procedure. And I shuffled this, this code due to different reasons. The first and the key factor that the general prosecutor's office controls everything related to the investigation. The investigator is not an independent procedural person. It doesn't work. Another aspect, the SBU is the former KGB, has an enormous powers in launching any, kind, any type of investigation. That's not their business, corruption. Corruption is to be entitled to special anti-corruption body but not to the National Security Service Committee. On the other hand, they propose some things that really upgraded or improved the procedural code, uh, the, the proposed criminal procedures. So we will not back, we will not support, we will not vote in favor of this uh, code of criminal procedures. But despite this, I, I can say that 
the blueprint of this code is actually better than an incumbent code of criminal procedure. On the issue of judges, that's very important. Judges are not independent. Under the Ukrainian constitution, president has the power to appoint judges. With no parliamentary assertion, with no parliamentary procedures. As a first time judge, the president just signed the decree for the five year term. Could this judge be independent? No, because he is on who? Of the, pres of the Institute of, of the President of Ukraine. That's the reason why we need to change the Constitution and to make the judicial system much more independent. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, since you have a neighbor that is Belarus, I would like to know what, the rela what your relations are, what the government relations to Belarus are, and whether it isn't a problem for Ukraine to have a neighbor mm -hmm which, well, it's also a dictator, it's one of the last dictatorships in Europe. Isn't that, doesn't that make your life, especially also in the Eastern Partnership, very difficult? Well, we are actually fine with neighbors, Russia, Belarus. <laughs> uh, <coughs> what we always ask our European partners, please do not isolate Belarus. And, and then, when I used to be the foreign minister, I always said it to Ferrero Weidner and to all big boss in the European Commission. So try to be cooperative with them. Try to do something with President Lukashenko. Uh, let's try to facilitate a stronger position in Belarus. Because their position in Belarus is really weak. That's the reason why they lost. And actually, the same happened in Russia. Fragmented and weak opposition no strong leadership and, and and that's that's the bad story or a good story for ukraine if we want to to win we need to be united so going back to belarus it's gonna take time it's gonna take time in order to change the regime in belarus and uh, my feeling is that uh, what we need we need to build up uh, a real leadership in the Belarus opposition and in Belarus society. Yeah. And they are actually in a very weak financial stance, Belarus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's another part of the problem. Uh, but they have people who are ready to support them. Mainly, these people are allocated in Russian Federation. And look what has happened with the uh, Belarus economy and with Belarus natural, uh, national currency. It's a huge devaluation. 200% if I'm not mistaken, last year. Unbelievable inflation. Inflation was just surging. And uh, in order somehow to stop the social riots, Belarus had to get the financial <coughs> resources. From where? Just from Russia. And this is very effective lever leverage. US dollars, euros, and Russian rubles are really effective in this kind of in this type of countries. With an election system which is partly a majority system, uh, how will you be able to form a union in the opposition so you are able to to challenge the the majority? present majority? Tough job. Tough job and what we did actually, uh, we had to propose to the voters a single list, a single opposition list, both on the majoritarian, on the single mandate counties and party list. And what are your prospects for? Expectations, you mean? Yeah. Only to win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but to form a single list. The, the because that's not the history of Ukrainian politics. I want to be absolutely frank. The single wins depends on two people today. On Yulia and on the party I am chairing. So together we have about 32% of the approval rate. But in case if we deliver strong messages to the voters, it could be better, much better. But we have a very bad history of these democratic unions in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's a doom, a doom of democracy. Tens of different leaders, 
everyone is brilliant, and no one is ready to, to unite. Uh, put it in a nutshell. I am ready to unite. Sounds fantastic. Let me ask you one more thing. I would like to know, as, you, as we have described now Ukraine between West and East, and you said, well, it's important that the population also understands that West is the right choice. How do you think, is it going to be possible to reach out to everybody? Because in our picture, we always see Ukraine as a sort of nearly split country in two halves. One part sort of closer to Russia, the other part closer to Europe. How do you think it's going to be possible during this election campaign and afterwards to convince the population in the East that the right choice is the European Union? The only chance is not to convince by declarations, by, but, by, but real deeds and acts. <coughs> visa facilitation regime, visa free regime, twin, twinning programs, uh, educational programs, uh, DCFTA, uh, the way how to decrease the unemployment uh, using the DCFTA leverage. So we need to act and to talk, to talk and to act, and to act and to talk. Um, it's not an easy job. It's not an easy job. And not only due to the fact that uh, it is the job to be done by Ukrainian politicians. Look, we, we will have a, a so-called outside problem, because our neighbors will definitely try to launch a public awareness campaign on the issue how Russian customs union is really great for the people of Ukraine. And we face the same again going back to NATO. Uh, <clears throat> so, my feeling is that <coughs> the only way to convince the voters is not with the statements and declaration, just with the real acts and deeds. This is the chance to regain the trust. Because, look, Ukrainians just hate politicians. And the only positive thing that it happens not only in Ukraine, but everywhere. Do we have any other questions from our visitors? Can I still have one question? Absolutely, you absolutely please. You mentioned your neighbors, Russia, European Union, even Russia, but there is still small, tiny neighbor in Moldova. And of course, uh, we see from the EU, NATO side, we're uh, 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 very positive on the current development, the 5 plus 2, yeah. finally started again, official talks. If, again, a position will win, do you have any your policy on how you would influence the reintegration process in Moldova? Uh, I want to be very clear. We, we are to support former 5 plus 2, as was agreed a few years ago. This is the only viable model how to find the solution. We need to move forward in terms of, this, in, in terms of uh, executing this formula and in terms of getting real results. <coughs> Romania is a major <laughs> nation south of you. Whatever source of, let's say, energy can you deduct from them? I mean, they are player in the region, no doubt, and not least in the Black Sea, in just reflecting in general terms, and the influence of Moldova, the Republic of Moldova, not the president province. There are some issues to be resolved between yes. Ukraine and Romania. You're well aware about the international court on, on the border, and the decision was, the verdict was two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, and more or less acceptable by both parties. Uh, we have a strong dialogue with our Romanian partners. Mm. But we envisage Romania as a part of the European Union True. and mm. as a close neighbor to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, there is a political and cultural dialogue. Uh, there are some things to be resolved and tackled. But uh, we feel that Romania is a real friend of Ukraine. And especially for your opposition, would there be, let's say, energy be to, to be derived from there? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, frankly, yeah. I mean, the political situation in this country, well, that country is not that easy. Yeah. One would find similarities, to put it discreetly. 
Are there any opportunities? The, 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 only, the only difference is that this is the final term, term of the President Bassett. Yep. Okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> never swear. Did I get it right that you were very critical of Mr. Fug Rasmussen and his attitude, uh, sounding like uh, 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 acting as Russia was a member of the NATO and uh, Ukraine evidently is not? Uh, I would rephrase. I am not very positive about statements of Mr. Uh, of General Secretary of NATO. Not very positive. I had him several times in Brussels, and I was always just like astonished on the new type of security system with Russia, on the cooperation between NATO and Russia, on the missile defense system. The the messages are very vague and unclear. But you expect that Mr. Putin will become very clear if, if, uh, if the ratification or, or of the treaty uh, between the European Union and Ukraine gets closer. It's true. Thank, thank you. Are there any other questions? That doesn't seem to be the case. So I would like to thank you very, very much. Thank you. It was very, very interesting, and I also thank you so much to, first of all, give us much time to discuss, which I always like a lot, and also to, after all, uh, paint a future that doesn't look all that dangerous and, uh, and glum. I must say, it was very good to hear some positive, good ideas, and I must say this, your idea of how to cooperate inside the opposition sounds for us very, very reassuring. And I think you can count on our help to try and help you bring the Ukraine forward and make the Ukraine the important partner the European Union really needs in the East. Thank you so much. Thank you.